A major challenge in mission is finding ways to reach the millions of people in cities around the world. The list of cities with a population of one million or more residents continues to grow. In response to this challenge, a number of churches in different cities have opened up urban centers of influence. Many of these centers function as language schools, health stores, restaurants, juice bars, and so on. But some groups have branched out and come up with ideas that are outside the box. In Frankfurt, Germany, Presence Culture Lounge invites people from the diverse community to come together and participate in different cultural activities. These include cooking and eating together, watching films and discussing them, participating in literature nights, and organizing art exhibitions. The events encourage individuals of similar interests, but of different religious and cultural backgrounds, to engage in conversations and to make connections. Pastor Simret Mahari, the founder of the center, says that in a secular society where the majority of people are skeptical of organized religion, the center is a place where people can feel they belong. Brian Atwell and his wife moved from the United States to Bangkok, Thailand, and opened a rock climbing gym. They had seen a documentary about Bangkok that revealed a need for general health education. The Atwells wanted to help people in this city know that they could take control of their health and avoid depending on costly medicine. They are now making connections with people using a fun and healthy activity. Samyuk Medical Center in Seoul, South Korea operates a two-story funeral home that also includes private apartments where grieving families stay as they mourn the loss of loved ones. In a country where much importance is given to funerals, the chaplains see the funeral service as an opportunity to share the hope of eternal life with the family members. This message is new to many of them, and families leave the service comforted and touched by the message. The funerals have also made a difference in the lives of the employees. Almost all of them are now baptized members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Adventists in Suva, Fiji, don't need four walls and a roof to run a center of influence. They are using a park located in the center of the city to provide food to the homeless every week. They also invite the park visitors to join them in Bible studies and in health and singing ministries. Many of the homeless have had their lives transformed as they've come to learn of a God who cares for their needs because of the services provided by the church members. If you are considering taking up the challenge to serve the cities, visit the Mission to the Cities website for ways that you can get involved. The American Heart Association recommends 40 minutes of aerobic exercise of moderate to vigorous intensity three to four times a week to lower the risk for heart attack and stroke. However, more than 80% of adults don't meet these guidelines. That's a fact, but there's hope. Don't have 30 minutes? Take three. In a recent Japanese study, moderate intensity physical activity between 32 seconds and 3 minutes was associated with improvements in components of metabolic syndrome, waist circumference, blood pressure, blood sugar, and blood fat levels. Integrating short bouts of activity throughout the day can be a healthy first step toward adopting a more active and happy lifestyle.
hymn number 240, 240, Fairest Lord Jesus. such a friend, him 186. I can safely go. Hymn 508 is our opening hymn. Please stand when you have found it. 508.
Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you for today. We want to thank you for the opportunity to gather together. We want to thank you, Lord, that anywhere with Jesus we can safely go. Thank you, Lord, for being here today for this service. We ask your Holy Spirit to be present. Lord, may we leave this place knowing today that we have spent time in your presence. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you come out. It's time that everyone comes back that has been worshiping with us. Um, there was one announcement that didn't get put in the bulletin. Um, in two weeks, the next time the pastor comes out, you're coming out second Sabbath in September? Okay, the next time the pastor comes out, second Sabbath in September, we are going to have a church potluck. It'll be the first one since before COVID. So make sure you come, make sure you bring food for your family, and we will have a good time worshiping together downstairs. Our scripture reading today is found in Mark 4, verses 39 to 41. When he arose, and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? May God bless us for reading his word. Our offering today is for conference advance. A time for spiritual revivement. We worship God with our resources because we are in a time of revival. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and the most urgent of all our needs. Revival is an invitation to turn away from other gods and acknowledge him as the sole Lord of our lives. The book of 2 Chronicles 29 to 31 tells us that the revival during the time of King Hezekiah, the temple was repaired. The worship services were restored. Passover was celebrated once again. Levites were reinstalled to ministry. Restoration of the worship was at the heart of the revival. People's response to the call to revival comprised of a concrete element. Then Hezekiah said, You have now dedicated yourselves to the Lord. Come and bring sacrifices and thank offerings to the temple of the Lord. So the assembly brought sacrifices and thank offerings and all the whose hearts were willing, brought burnt offerings. Spiritual revival acknowledges God as Lord, and one tangible means is to honor him with our gifts. The story of Zacchaeus in the New Testament presents giving as a result of true spiritual revivment. Before welcoming Jesus as his guest of honor, he he was the greediest man in Jericho. He was ready to betray his country, lose his friends, forsake his religion, and sacrifice his reputation for just a little bit more. However, when salvation entered his house, he was prompted to give more than what he owed. I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. That was his love response to the love he received from Jesus. Can we give without loving, but we cannot love without giving? The call for a spiritual revival is resounding loud in our churches. This week as we worship with our tithes and regular offerings, would it show that the revival message is taking root in our heart once again? And like for the last few years, we haven't been doing 
a whole lot with evangelism and so forth. And our conference would like to get back to doing those things. Let us just bow for prayer before the offering is taken up. Lord, help us to respond to your call of revival. We thank you for the blessings that you give each one of us, for the homes we have, for the jobs we have to go to. And we ask you to bless us in a special way as we return the tithe to you and give offerings for your cause. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, it's time for our church family prayer. Does anyone have any prayer requests? Janet? Okay. Terry? Oh. So much pain and just giving up on life. Pray for his healing. Um, this week, my daughter Wendy, who lives in Alberta, phoned in her best friend's son was helping his father on the farm getting ready for harvest. They were moving a bin and he got electrocuted. He is in the Calgary Hospital right now, it didn't, like we don't know how it didn't kill him. Um, the electricity came out the tops of his feet, both of his feet. And there's also another wound on, on one of the arms. Um, he was knocked unconscious at first, but the ambulance when they got there, he talked to the medics that came to help him. And they took him into Red Deer and then into um, um, to Calgary. And so we'll pray for him for, for healing. Also, some of you know Judy Fulston. Judy had surgery yesterday, second knee replacement. The surgery went well, but we'll pray that the healing will also go well too. Anyone else? There's health issues all over, isn't there? <laughs> okay. Nasal home is Dennis's cousin, and she is having open heart surgery in September, too. Okay, wherever possible, will you please kneel? Our Father in heaven, we praise you for being such a loving God. We praise you for the love that you show to us and that you will answer the prayers that we have for healing. We are so thankful that Inus is doing better, that she is walking better and on a road to recovery, especially at, at her age, that she's improving. And we ask you to continue to be with her and help her to improve some more. And we pray for Jay, for his health, healing of his bones and um, the other health issues that he has, 
that you will be close to him and let him feel your, your presence there too. And we pray for Mackenzie that you will be with the doctors that are working with him now, that he's having his feet fixed today, that you will be with that. And then be with him when he's moved to the burn unit. We pray that you will be with his mother also, who is, has many health issues now too. And be with his dad. Duke is, has basically fallen apart that he feels responsible for his son. Be, be close to him too. We pray for Judy after her knee surgery. We thank you that the surgery went so well and that you will help her heal um, in a good way and help her through the physio that is to come, which is very hard too. We pray for Amanda, for her health, that uh, you will be with her and let her know that you are close to her too. And we pray for Maisel Holm. She has heart surgery coming up, um, that you will be with her and the doctors as they perform this surgery. And we ask you to bless the congregation here today in a special way. Help them to open their minds to what the pastor has to say and that um, we will take a special blessing from this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, our children's story will be on the screen, and so will the um, special music. And right after the special music, Pastor Troy will give us his message. Hi, everyone. It's Aunt Fernita. Today's story is called Favorite Son. The memory verse is from John chapter 15, verse 12. It says, Love each other as I have loved you. Today's message is God helps me love my Christian family. Is there anything that you really wish you had? Have you ever wanted it so badly that it made you angry because someone else had it and you didn't? Ten boys wanted what their brother had. They were so jealous of him that they planned something terrible. Joseph had eleven brothers, ten older brothers, and one younger brother. The older brothers did not like him at all. They probably left him out of the games they played. They didn't take him with them when they went somewhere. They didn't want to be around him. The Bible says they hated him. Joseph was Father Jacob's favorite son. Their father always gave him the best presents. When Father Jacob made Joseph a colorful new coat, all the brothers were jealous. They didn't think Joseph deserved nicer things than they got. Joseph's brothers also thought he was proud, which made them even angrier. Once God gave Joseph a dream that he and his brothers had been cutting stalks of grain and tying them into sheaves. Suddenly, all of his brothers' sheaves bowed to his. Another time, he dreamed that the sun, moon, and eleven stars had bowed down to him. Father Jacob asked, Does this mean that you will rule over your mother and me someday? They enjoyed being out on their own with no little brother to annoy them. But one day, Father Jacob asked Joseph to find them and to see how they were. Joseph, wearing his bright new coat, went in search of his brothers, and they saw him coming. 
Here comes the dreamer, they said. Let's kill him and throw his body into a well. They were all alone with the sheep. No one would know what they had done. The oldest brother, Reuben, disagreed. Don't kill him, he argued. Let's not shed any blood. Throw him into this dry well, but don't hurt him. Reuben knew that Joseph wouldn't be able to get out. The brothers could scare Joseph by leaving him in the well. Reuben didn't want to kill Joseph. He secretly planned to take Joseph out of the well later. Then he would take him back to their father. So when Joseph arrived, what a shock was waiting. His brothers didn't welcome him. They grabbed him and threw him into the well. Then Reuben left for a while. Before Reuben returned, a caravan of traders passed by, and the nine brothers sold Joseph to them. He would become a slave. When Reuben returned, he looked for Joseph in the well, but didn't find him. He tore his clothes to show how upset he was and went to his brothers. The boy is gone. What shall I do? He cried. So the brothers killed a goat and soaked Joseph's beautiful coat in its blood. They would tell their father that Joseph had been killed by a wild animal. Joseph was actually on his way to Egypt. He would be far away from his father, his brothers, and his lovely coat. What would become of him? Jesus asks us to love our brothers and sisters. He says this for a reason. Our families fall apart when we don't love one another. Jesus doesn't want our family, the church, to fall apart. He will help you love your home and your church family. Ask Him to help you be loving. This podcast is read by Franita Buddy for Gracelink.net. Created and produced by Falbo Fowler. Post produced by Faith Toe at Studio El Piso. The theme music is by Clayton Kinney. Animation and artwork by Giogo Godoy. The audio engineer was Karel Holness. For more information, please visit gracelink.net.
feels good to be back in the house of the Lord. We uh, enjoyed uh, some holidays this uh, year after camp. We um, did some fishing, and then uh, we actually celebrated our 25th anniversary that's coming up in September, a little early, and so we took a drive out to the West Coast, when, uh, Vancouver Island, so we enjoyed some whale watching. Uh, God created some massive creatures, I tell you. Uh, we actually even got to see a, one of the humpback whales breach and come out, so it was, it was pretty, pretty neat. Um, after camp meeting, though, we, we went up, uh, what we usually do is we go fishing up to uh, Rocky Lake. Uh, we, uh, we made our way up there and enjoyed some downtime on the lake, and, and uh, one day when we were fishing, um, you know the story that was read in Mark chapter 4 uh, came alive. You know, you've heard of the Bible and living sound. And, and then, um, you know, the, some of these authors are, I don't know if it's Aunt Jenny or whatever, and they, they, they're true-to-life stories that they go through, the Bible stories. And what well, we experienced, a true-to-life story. Um, Rocky Lake is a, a lake that uh, has rocks all the way around the outside. Uh, they're towering rocks on some sides. Some are just nice, long, uh, soft rocks where um, you, can, you can pull your boat up, you can get out and just walk on the rock. It's very, very nice. If you've never been there, it's, it's a place to, to see. The lake is quite, quite large, and so if uh, any breeze, wind comes up, the lake gets really, really rough in a hurry. And You know, before we even go out uh, fishing for the day, we, we look out our window, and you can tell we, uh, Dad has a a little shed for the the boat, and there's a tarp that hangs in the in the doorway of the shed. And if that tarp is moving at all, we know that you know what we can't go out on on Rocky Lake. We have to go to a smaller lake where it's it's actually just as fun to fish. There's a uh, lake tr- or there's um, brook trout in there, rainbow trout and speckled trout, and so uh, we like to do that if if Rocky Lake is too uh, too if it's too windy and too wavy. And so, and, you, and if, if the tarp isn't, you know, moving that much, you, you know, you look at the treetops and you can tell if there's any leaves blowing or if the, if the treetops are moving at all, you know what, you don't, you don't stand a chance. Well, this one day, um, it was Friday afternoon, it was about 4.30, uh, the sun was shining, it was hot, and there was no wind. And so we thought, what a, what a beautiful day to be out on the lake, and so we loaded up the pontoon, and we, we got down to the lake, and, and as, you, as you turn the corner to where the boat dock is, you can look out, and you can see how, how rough the water is. Well, we were coming down the water, and you looked, and it was just like glass. And so we were excited. We, we launched the boat, and, and we headed out across uh, 
across Rocky Lake to the Narrows. They call it the Narrows. Uh, it actually, Rocky, when I say Rocky Lake, we, we only see the one side. And then there's a narrow, and then I guess it goes into an equal-sized lake on the other side. And so we only stay on the one side, and, it, and it's large. And so uh, we headed out across to the Narrows, and it's about seven kilometers or so. And uh, it was just beautiful. We come back, we made a pass. We were fishing for bass. The day before, we saw a bunch of bass, and they, were, they weren't biting. You could see them swim under the boat. We were getting a little bit frustrated, but what do you do when they're, when they're not biting? So you, we went to the tackle shop and bought some, some lures that they said, oh, these are the ones that work. And so we were excited to use our, our, uh, our bass lures. And, so we started trolling uh, this, this section of, of the lake where normally we catch bass. And uh, we made one pass and we turned around and we were heading back the other way. And, and it started to get a little bit, you know, not as glassy, but uh, it wasn't bad. And, and uh, so we were trolling and like I say, there's, there's rocks that, that come out and in some places, the rocks are actually hidden under the water, so they come out quite a ways. And so I was sitting uh, near the front, and, and Dad was driving the boat, and, and uh, the waves started getting pushing us a little bit closer to shore. And, and I said to, the, to my dad, I said, uh, you're over top of a big rock. Like, you know, and, and then the pontoon started hitting the rock. And then I said, you better back up because, you know, you're, you're going to catch this rock. And so he put it in reverse, and as soon as he put it in reverse, there goes my line, there goes his line, uh, caught in the, in the propeller of the, the boat. So it snapped both of our lines, and so we, uh, he shut off the motor, lifted the motor up, and that's when I climbed out onto the motor upside down, and I'm cutting the, the, the line off of the, the boat propeller. I don't know how long I was there, um, it didn't seem very long. I would say five minutes or so. Or, and, uh, but I could tell that it was, you know, I had my head down. It was getting a little bit wavier. And, and so by the time I cut our lines off and I, I got up and I crawled back into the boat, Lynette handed me a, a life jacket. And I thought, well, what's, a, what's the life jacket for? You know, we're, it was just nice. And you look out across the lake uh, to the north, and uh, you could just see the storm was just rolling in, and the waves started now coming across. They were white caps now. And uh, our, our decision to continue to fish was over. We weren't fishing very long. And so by the time we turned around and we started heading in, uh, the, the waves were just crashing on the side of the, the, the pontoon. The water was running over top of the deck. Um, we did have a couple of fish in the, in the tank, and the tank was emptying out. You could see the water was splashing in there. And Lynette and Tucker moved to the front of the boat because we had our awning up, and because what if the boat goes over? You know, you don't want to get caught under the awning, right? And so they moved to the front of the, the boat, and so we just slowly made our way to shore. And uh, I had a friend, he stopped to pick up his, his stuff uh, from the cabin, and he was heading farther up north, and and he sent a text to me, and he said, uh, get off the lake. He said, there's a storm coming. And I said, we're trying, you know. It had already reached us. They hit it uh, a few miles north of, of town, or of the, of the lake on their way up to um, Wukusko. And so as, as these, the boat was rocking, uh, you know, we looked, I looked over. Lynette's, you know, white-knuckling the front there. Uh, my mom has the cell phones in... Uh, in a Ziploc bag, and she's got them tucked in her, her uh, life jacket. And her claim was that, you know, if we were to go over, we would save her because she had the cell phones. I said, just put air in the bag and we'll be okay. Uh, we'll find them, right? But um, I looked back, and we had our, our puppy with us, and, and on, on the bench in her bed, she was fast asleep. And you, she didn't even know what was going on. The, the, everybody else was scared in the boat, and there was our four-month-old puppy just sound asleep and uh it was it was incredible to see that she had a peace during that that time uh of storm uh you know with many silent prayers that were said on the way uh we did eventually get safely to shore and and there was lightning coming across there was a an island that's called ghost island that when you're coming from the certain uh boat launch there's two boat launches when you're coming from the other boat launch you don't see this island until you get past a, a certain point and they call it ghost island because it just pops up and there it is and 
I have pictures that, of the lightning, and there's a lightning bolt right over Ghost Island. <laughs> so it was quite, a, quite an experience, but uh, I, can, I can just picture what happened there, uh, you know, when, when Jesus and his disciples were out on the, on the boat and the storm come up uh, quite suddenly, right? Let's uh, bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you that you are always there for us. Lord, no matter what storms we face, no matter what turmoil that is happening, Lord, you seem to be right there in the midst, and Lord, you carry us through, even though sometimes our circumstances, Lord, seem like they're impassable. Lord, you bring them to be, and so we give thanks for that, Lord. We thank you that you can give us peace amongst the storm. Lord, we ask you to bless us during this time, we pray in Jesus' name. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus began his public ministry in Galilee soon after John the Baptist was arrested by Herod. The Bible tells us that Jesus came preaching the good news of God, proclaiming that the critical hour was at hand, saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Well, Jesus went out into the wilderness to be baptized by John and, and then was tempted by the devil and Jesus returned from the wilderness and he immediately began preaching about the kingdom of God and calling disciples to follow him. We have uh, Mark 1, 16 to 20, and it, it talks about that, uh, that time. It says, and he, Jesus, was going along by the Sea of Galilee. He saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to Jesus, and Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little farther, he said, James, uh, saw James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, mending his, the nets. Immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went away to follow him. You know, who is this who leads with such confidence that men follow? You know, when Jesus entered the village of Capernaum, he entered the synagogue and began to teach with authority. And what's interesting is the fact that he immediately was recognized by a demon as the Holy One of God who would bring power, who has the power to bring judgment. And all those who witnessed this interaction were absolutely astonished. Mark 24, verse 27, saying, What business do we have with, thee, with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. Verse 27 says, they were all amazed so that they debated among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. Mark, 32, Mark 1, 32 to 34 continues. It says, when evening came after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and all those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city had gathered at the door, and he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. Of course, the demons knew who he was uh, because uh, they once worshipped him, right, in heaven before they had rebelled. Jesus' disciples witnessed some very amazing things in the months since he had called them to follow him. Jesus had cast out devil, demons. He healed the sick. He'd forgiven sins. Multitudes of suffering people were following him wherever he went. But as his public ministry continues to unfold, it becomes increasingly clear that the religious leaders of Israel will not receive Jesus as their Messiah. Even though it should have been obvious that Jesus was sent by God. You know, the many miracles that were performed by Jesus should have been enough of a confirmation, the sign that the kingdom of God had indeed come, for the demons themselves recognized it. But the teachers of the law, those who should have been able to recognize who this was, when they witnessed such miracles and signs, their response 
to Israel's Messiah, the Son of God, was complete rejection. You know, the Bible tells us that the scribes and Pharisees were conspiring to have Jesus killed because he dared to heal on the Sabbath. And because Jesus and his disciples ate with tax collectors and sinners, people whom the Pharisees considered unclean. In fact, they even accused him of being demon-possessed. The sad reality is that even Jesus' own family did not, only, did not really understand who he was nor what his messianic mission was all about. Mark 3, verses 20 to 22 says, And he came home, and the crowd gathered again to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal. When his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying, He has lost his senses. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebub, and he casts out the demons by the ruler of demons. You know, troubling questions begin to arise in the minds of the disciples. Who exactly is Jesus? Is he a prophet? Is he the Messiah? And why is it that Jesus is not being accepted and welcomed by the religious leaders? Who is this man who speaks with such authority about great mysteries of God and who has the power to heal and cast out demons? You know, this morning I want to share with you a series of three miracles that take place where Jesus tries to help the disciples better understand who he is. The first we find in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. And it says, On that day, when evening came, he said to them, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took, with him, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there arose, it says, a fierce gale of a wind. You know, I uh, looked up a gale, or a strong gale, and uh, according to, uh, it, was a, it was a sea website, um, I don't have it here, I thought I had it, but it says here, a gale has moderately high, it says 18 to 25 foot waves of greater length. Uh, Edges of crests begin to break into uh, spin drift, foam blown in streaks, and it says it is uh, 40, up to 40 knots is uh, a gale, and uh, 40 knots is somewhere around 47 kilometers an hour of a wind. And so a strong gale, it says high waves and 23 to 32 foot uh, waves, that's in length, it's not in, in height obviously, right? Sea begins to roll. It says the dense streaks from the foam spray to reduce visibility. And, and it says a strong gale can be up to 87 kilometers an, an hour. Um, sorry, 40 knots is 75 kilometers an hour. 47 knots is 87 kilometers an hour. And so it says, uh, it says in our, our reading here that there was a fierce gale of a wind. It says, and it continues, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so much so that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, peace be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, why are you afraid? Do you not, do you still have no faith? Verse 41 says, and they became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? You know, if the disciples were terrified by the storm, then they must have been equally terrified being in the presence of someone who can awake from a sound sleep and speak to the storm and have it immediately cease. 
But while the disciples were still trying to make sense of what Jesus had just done, he said to his disciples, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? You know, surely by now, having witnessed all that God had done in their presence through the ministry of Jesus, these men should have placed their faith in Jesus and his ability to deliver them through any circumstance. But this didn't seem to be the case. You know, the second miracle I want to share with you is in Mark 5, verses 1 through 13. It says, Then they came to the other side of the sea, this must have been after the storm. It says, into the country of Gerasenes. When he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him, and he said, and he had his dwelling place among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. And no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. And shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you, by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, what is your name? And he said to him, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding near the mountain. The demons implored him, saying, send us into the swine so that we may enter them. And Jesus gave them permission and coming out of the unclean spirit, and the spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. You know, no human, po no human power could have subdued the power of Satan. But Jesus just demonstrated that he not only has absolute control over nature, but here he reveals that he also has absolute control over Satan and his minions. The third miracle is found again in Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 23, and then again in 35 to 43, it says, And when Jesus had crossed over again into the boat, to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him. And so they stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up and on seeing him fell at his feet and implored him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. Verse 35 continues, it says, while he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official saying, your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid any longer, only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the synagogue official, and he saw a commotion, and people loudly weeping and wailing, and entering in, he said to them, Why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. They began laughing at him. But putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered the room where the child was. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the Bible tells us the girl got up and began to walk, and she was 12 years old. And immediately, there were, they were completely astounded, and he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this, and he said that something should be given to her to eat. You know, Jesus just demonstrated to his disciples that he even has authority over the dead. 
Jesus calms the sea. He casts out a legion of demons, and now he has raised the dead slowly but surely. Jesus' true identity is being revealed to them. In light of all of this, you would think that the people of Israel would realize that Jesus is the promised Messiah and the Son of God. You would think that those who had heard Jesus preach and who witnessed his miraculous power would repent of their sins and trust in him just as Jesus had commanded them to do, but sadly, they do not. Now it is Jesus who marvels at the depth of unbelief on the part of the people of his own town, own hometown. So after the three dramatic miracles Jesus has just performed, the time has come for Jesus to preach elsewhere, starting with a journey to his hometown of Nazareth. And the people had also heard about Jesus' miracles, making it clear that Jesus' reputation as a miracle worker had preceded him. Mark 6, verses 1 through 6, it says, Jesus went from there and came to his hometown. And his disciples followed him. When Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and the many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things, and what is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles these performed by his hands. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, and Jose, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, and among his own relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered, it says, at their unbelief. The sad thing is that these people do not get let their prejudices, their culture, their small town ways allow them to see the obvious. The kingdom of God had come to their village, but they didn't see it because it came in the person of the son of Mary, the carpenter. And why should they listen to him? Jesus now considers the twelve are ready to go out and preach as his representatives, as well as cast out any demons that they may encounter. And so he sends them out two by two, and Mark 6, 12 to 13 says, they went out and preached that men should repent, and they were casting out demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. According to Mark, the disciples did just as Jesus commanded. The disciples preached the same basic message that Jesus began preaching when he first appeared in Capernaum. The time had come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. The result was that the kingdom of God was manifest wherever they went. As many people were healed and demons were cast out. You know, by this time, some of the people think that Jesus is John the Baptist that came back to life. Others think Jesus is Elijah, and still others think that he is one of the prophets. But there is no doubt in anyone's mind, except the religious leaders of Israel, that God's hand is upon Jesus, and that something of truly biblical proportions is going on through, this, through his ministry. Who is this? You know, while even Herod recognized something was different about Jesus, it was the religious leaders that demand a sign. Mark 8, 11 says the Pharisees came and began to question Jesus, to test him. They asked him for a sign from heaven. You know, after all that Jesus had done in the sight of men, he did nothing in secret. There was always a witness of his works. So such a demand is not only a personal insult, but it reveals that the Pharisees were absolutely blinded to the truth. They have seen the miracles of Jesus and performed and have been more than willing to attribute the source of them to Satan rather than God. The question, I'm sure, on the minds of so many people of Israel was, who is this? Who is this Jesus? Here's where the question of, 
who Jesus was comes to a climax in the story. Jesus, knowing the minds and the thoughts of the people, wanted to hear from his disciples what they had been hearing. And so he asked the general question in Mark 8, verse 27. Who do people say that I am? You know, having heard what he already knew to be true, that the people were confused and did not understand his true identity, Jesus now follows up with a much more direct and clarifying question. And he says, But what about you? Jesus asked. Who do you say I am? Jesus knew that the pivotal moment in his ministry was at hand. Jesus must soon begin his journey, which would eventually take him to Jerusalem. And he wanted to make sure that his disciples knew for certain who he was. Can you imagine spending so much time with the disciples and everybody around is confused, the religious leaders are confused, actually who Jesus was. And Jesus wanted to make sure that his disciples knew who he was. And so he asked the question, but you, who do you say I am? In the words that Jesus, I'm sure, longed to hear, Peter says in Mark 8, 29, Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. And although the question was put to all of them, it was Peter who answered. Peter said, You are the Christ. In uttering these remarkable words, Peter is confessing that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the one that they had been waiting for who would who was chosen and called by God to deliver God's people from sin. Friends, the reality of the fact is this. It doesn't matter what men say about who Jesus is. It doesn't matter whether some are able to give the correct answer to the question or not. Jesus' leading question was not the one of importance. The question that truly mattered at that point in time, and perhaps more importantly to you and I at this very moment in time, is Jesus' follow-up question. But who do you say I am? And you and I must answer that question one way or another. If after all that we have read and heard about who Jesus is and we come to the conclusion that Jesus is merely a prophet or some good guy who did good works, then I believe that we have missed the whole point and we are as blind as the religious leaders who sought after a sign in order to believe. And if we think that Jesus is just a, a mythical figure, then our hearts have remained hardened to the truths that have been presented to us and we still remain in our sin. But on the other hand, if you know yourself to be a sinner and if you have come to believe all that you know to be true about Jesus and that Jesus has come to save you from your sins, then there is not a moment to waste. This is God's appointed time for your and my salvation. Now is the time to confess of Jesus with Peter, with his disciples, with Christ's people throughout the ages, that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Holy One of God. Friends, God has sent his only Son. He is the one. There is no other. Nor is there going to be another. The question I present to you is, so who do you say he is? And if you've come to know that your answer to Jesus' question is, you are the Christ. Yes, you are the Christ. If that's the answer that you want to give today, I want you to stand with me as we conclude in prayer.
Father God, as we are reaching the end of our time on this earth, there is no better time to know you. Today we stand proclaiming the truth of who Jesus is. He is the Messiah, the anointed one, your chosen one that you sent to save us from our sins and its penalty. Father, forgive us for our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is our plea that you help us to remain in a saving relationship with you day by day. Thank you for the revelation of your son. It is in his name we pray. Amen. In closing, you can turn your hymnals to hymn number 185. Jesus is all the world to me. Jesus is all. Father, how could it be that we have a friend such as Jesus? Thank you for sending your son. Thank you for revealing to us the Messiah, the chosen one, the one who would save us from our sins. And thank you, Lord, that we have the privilege and honor to accept you as our Savior. Father, be with us as we face the storms of this coming week and perhaps, Lord, the days ahead. We know that our time on earth is numbered, and Lord, we know that the devil is, is wreaking havoc wherever he goes. We know, Lord, that he wants to take us down with us, with him. But Father, protect us, just like you protected the disciples amongst the storm. Calm our storms as they come, 
with the peace that passes all understanding. Lord, we, you may not take us from the storm, but Lord, we ask that you will give us that peace. Take us through to the end. Keep us faithful. Help us to walk day by day in your presence. And go with us now, Lord, as we leave this place. Bless the remaining of our Sabbath, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.